This evening we're looking at Lord's Day 32 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Two questions there. Now read the question, and I invite the congregation to read the answer in unison. Question 86. We have been delivered from our misery by God's grace alone through Christ, and not because we have earned it. Why then must we still do good? To be sure, Christ has redeemed us by his blood. But we do good because Christ by his spirit is also renewing us to be like himself, so that in all our living we may show that we are thankful to God for all he has done for us, and so that he may be praised through us. And we do good so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and so that by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and impenitent ways? By no means. Scripture tells us that no sexually immoral person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no greedy person, no drunkard, slanderer, swindler, or the like, is going to inherit the kingdom of God. And now I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Our passage, or our focus, is going to be verses 8 through 10, but we're going to look at the entirety of verses 1 through 10 this evening. This is God's Word. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. This evening, we come to the third part of the Heidelberg Catechism. Uh, as you may know, there are three parts to the Catechism. There is guilt, grace, and gratitude, or sin, salvation, service. And Lord's Day 32, which we're looking at this evening, stands at the hinge of our salvation and our service in response to that salvation. We're moving into how we are to live in thankfulness to God for His great salvation. More specifically, we're looking at the place that good works have in the Christian life and in the plan of God. And we're answering the question, why must we do good if we're saved solely by Christ's work? There are many places we can go to in Scripture to see various reasons for doing good in the Christian life. But this evening, I'd like us to see the big picture of the gospel and the big picture of God's redemption plan in Ephesians chapter 2, because it's ultimately the gospel that gives us the key motivation for doing good works. And we're going to see that our good works are actually part of God's redemption plan 
to save us in the first place? Answer 86 of the Catechism, which we just read, says that Christ has redeemed us by His blood, but Christ by His Spirit is also renewing us to look like Himself. And we're going to put a special focus on that line this evening, that Christ not only redeems us, but also is renewing us. He's recreating us. We're going to see this evening that God's gracious work of recreating us in Christ enables us to do good works. We have two points this evening. First, we are not saved by works of our own. And second, we are rather saved for works prepared by God. First, it's very clear from our passage that we are not saved by works of our own. Verse 8, For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not your own doing. Throughout this section in Ephesians, we see this sharp contrast between what was true of us apart from God and what is true of us now that we are in Christ by the grace of God. We're given a before and after, a snapshot of ourselves, before grace and after grace. What did we look like before grace? Here's the portrait that Paul paints of all of those who are outside of Jesus Christ. Dead in our trespasses. Spiritually dead. Walking in sins. Following the course of this world. That is, living in lockstep with this world and our culture. Being shaped and influenced by sinful ways of living. And not only that, we're following the prince of the power of the air. That's talking about the devil. Enslavement to the devil. And then enslavement to our sinful desires, as Paul would go on to say. The passions of our flesh, the desires of the body and the mind. And then he says, like the rest of mankind, we were children of wrath. That is, those who deserve God's wrath, his divine anger against sin. The portrait we're faced with is that of death, disobedience, enslavement, and condemnation. It is not a flattering image of who and what we are. And this is not simply because we've been socially conditioned that way, and so the way to fix it is better laws and societal reform, simply. It's not because we've picked up these bad habits from people around us or previous generations, so all we need is simply to have better role models. No, we are by nature children of wrath, says Paul. This is our natural condition as sons and daughters of Adam. We are born in sin, says Psalm 51. We are born depraved in every area of life, Unable to do good, unable to please God or even to seek God. This is our predicament as sinners. We have refused to live in fellowship with God, which is what we were made for in the first place. Fellowship with God, to know Him, to love and be loved by Him. We have lived against the grain of our very being as human beings. Because that's what sin is, isn't it? A refusal to live for God and a refusal to live with God. We've said no to God. We've cut ourselves off from God, the source of life. And is it any wonder then that we are called dead in our trespasses and sins, cut off from the source of all life? But then look with me at verse 4, how it begins there. But God. Those two simple words are our lifeline. Words of hope. Words of life. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
Here we see God's relentless resolve to be our God and to save us from our sin. His utter determination to put an end to our opposition of Him. Do you see, we refused God. But in the gospel, God refuses our refusal of Him. God sees us say, we refuse you, God. We hate you. We don't need you. We don't want you. And he comes to us saying, I refuse your refusal. I have determined to save you, to make you mine, in my great love and mercy. And he changes us and he rescues us by his grace. Just look at the words that Paul piles up in verse 4 alone. 4 and 5. God has richly shown us mercy. He has spared us from His wrath by redirecting that anger towards His Son on the cross. God has loved us with a love that is greater than all our sins. This is a boundless love. This is a conquering love. A love that conquers and triumphs over sin. It's an unchanging love. We see in the previous chapter, verses 4 and 5, that in love, He predestined us. He chose us from before the foundation of the world to make us His own. God has given us grace, says Paul, granting favor to those who deserve the exact opposite, salvation for those who deserve condemnation. And by God's grace, we're told three things are now true of us. Three things. God has made us alive together with Christ. He has raised us up with Him. And He has seated us with Him in the heavenly places. We know that Christ was made alive from from the dead. He was raised up in His ascension. And He was seated at the right hand of God. We know that's true of Him. But the point is that what's true of Christ is now equally true of us who are in Him by faith because we've been united to Christ by believing in Him. That's what this language of being in Christ is talking about. Being in Christ Jesus. We've been incorporated into Him, joined to Him, bound to Him so that His abundant life now flows to us. We have been co-made alive with Christ, co-raised, and co-seated with Him in the heavenly places. Now, we know that this is not true of us right now in our experience. This is describing the glory to come. And yet, our enthronement, our glorification in heaven, the honor and glory that await us in Christ is so certain and so sure that Paul can speak of it as already having happened. We're as good as made alive and raised and seated in glory. There's a place for us there already because we are in Christ by faith. And all of this, says Paul, is by grace and grace alone. Sola gratia. It's God's grace from start to finish. And as we're going to see, this is a grace then that produces works and enables us to do good works for His glory, but never to to maintain our standing before God, never to earn a place in glory before God. What does Paul say in verse 8? This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Which means the gospel is a death blow to self-effort and self-salvation. It's a death blow to human pride because in our pride, we imagine that we can contribute something and do something to make God owe us and save us on our merit, even in part. But no, you didn't do anything, says the Lord. 
to persuade him to save you. You didn't do anything beforehand that he may see that you're worthy. Verse 1 says you were dead, incapacitated. Further on, it says you were enslaved, a captive to the devil and your sinful desires. You didn't do anything to make yourself alive, and you didn't do anything to set yourself free from your enslavement. The gospel tells us that God did it all by His grace, leaving absolutely no room for boasting in your own doing, in your own goodness or worthiness. The only contribution you have made to your salvation is the sin that made it necessary for salvation in the first place. That's the hard truth that we face as sinners. But it's such good news because it means our salvation is in the hands of God and not us. And in case you think that having faith, believing in Jesus, is doing something to earn your salvation, no, faith is simply resting in what God has done in Christ for you, a sinner. Faith is, we can say, the open hand that delights to receive and not the busy hand that works to achieve. It's the open hand that delights to receive, not the busy hand that works to achieve. We are saved through faith, for sure, as an instrument, as the hand that accepts the gift, but not as the source of our salvation. That glory belongs to God and God alone. So we've seen, apart from Christ, our works are worthless, which is humbling. But we see that in Christ, our works become the way that we show our lifelong thankfulness for what God has done for us. We express our thankfulness through our works. Which brings us to our second point, that we are saved for works prepared by God. Reading verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That word translated workmanship there, it's a fascinating word. It suggests that we are God's work of art, His masterpiece, His creation, His handiwork, but not creation in the sense that all human beings are created in the image of God. Not in that sense, because what does Paul say? We are His workmanship, His creation, created in Christ Jesus. In short, salvation involves a re-creation, a second creation. In Christ, God makes us a new creation. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. Brothers and sisters, to begin with, we are God's created beings. But now in Christ, we are doubly created. We belong doubly to God. First, by creation, and second, by recreation. And we're no, no more responsible for this recreation as we were for the first creation. It's purely an act of God. And in this recreation, God delivers us from the old patterns of sin that lead to death, and He reworks us, He sculpts us. He shapes us and fashions us into His own likeness. Which is why later on, in Ephesians 4.24, Paul will say that we are to put on the new self, created in Christ Jesus, after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And it should be pretty clear to us that there are echoes here of Genesis, the first two chapters, the creation story. In the first creation, 
we were made in the likeness and the image of God, which was damaged through the fall. But in this second recreation, we are restored to the likeness of God in Christ, in true righteousness and holiness. And that shows us, brothers and sisters, that this is what God wants for us, a righteous and holy life a life of doing good, a life that reflects who God is. For Paul says in verse 10 that we have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Wouldn't you agree that it's always important to know what something is created for? To give an example, one that might make some of the orchestral people in our congregation to cringe, if you take an intricately handcrafted violin, but you don't know what it's for, and you use it as a hammer instead, or to play tennis, good shot, or to tenderize your meat, these things are not what it's created for. It's no use that way. It's the same with us as God's people, recreated in Christ. If we engage in sexual immorality, in sins that displease the Lord, that distort who He is and who we are made to be. We are not being who we are created and recreated for, to be. The Catechism asks, if we're saved by grace alone and not by works, which is true, why must we still do good? Well, it's because doing good is precisely what God has made us for in his likeness in the church there are two errors which can raise their heads when it comes to our good works one which we're probably very familiar with is legalism legalism which says you've got to do good in order to earn your right standing with god do this and this and that otherwise you're out But we need to be careful not to fall off the other side of the horse because on the other side is the era of antinomianism. Antinomianism, which says, well, since God's grace covers everything, why not sin a little bit more? What's the point of good works if we're not saved by works? But as the Catechism points out, Scripture states very clearly that those who continue in immorality and ungodly living will not inherit the kingdom of God. It does not show that you have received God's gift of grace, which transforms us and recreates us. Congregation, we are to do good works, not to be saved, but because we're saved. And not only that, but because, according to verse 10, God has prepared beforehand the good works that we should walk in. I want to look at that for a moment. Verse 10. This means that God has planned out the good works that we are to do. His redemption plan does not stop at getting us into heaven. Oh, ticket to heaven and you're done. No, He paves the path of good works as we get there. Works in which we are to walk, as Paul puts it. Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 1, verse 4. That God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in Him, before Him. Which means in eternity past, God not only chose to save you, but He also prepared the good works in which you should walk. That's a part of his plan. That's the part of the package of salvation. And notice how the image of walking in verse 10 takes us back to verse 1, which speaks about the trespasses and sins in which you walked. Before grace, you walked in sin, but now after grace, you are to walk in good works prepared by God for his glory. Brothers and sisters, remember who you are now, that you are in Christ, that you are a 
created masterpiece, workmanship of God. And who you are ought to determine what you do. It's not the other way. Who you are in Christ, this identity, should be what your good works flow out from. This is an identity that has been given as a gift to you by grace and not your own doing. In our present cultural moment, there's a lot of talk about being self-made, isn't there? We talk about self-made entrepreneurs, self-made Instagram influencers, self-made billionaires and celebrities. And we're increasingly being called and pressured to become self-creators, to cultivate personal brands, to craft our personal unique identities, to perform accordingly once we've done that, to curate our personal selves, even our professional selves, and let everyone know about it, put it online for public consumption. Be who you want to be because that's who you're meant to be. We hear about gender identity, identity politics. It's all about defining, crafting, and sculpting your own unique identity. In a book titled Self-Made, Creating Our Identities from Da Vinci to the Kardashians, the author argues that our culture's belief in the power of self-creation is directly related to our culture's decline in its belief in a God who created us. Having removed God from the story of what it means to be human in the first place, human beings are now giving themselves God-like status, self-creation. And the author writes, at the core of this collective project of self-creation lies one vital assumption that who we are deep down at the most fundamental level, that who we are is who we most want to be. Our desires, our longings, our yearning to become or to acquire or to be seen in a certain way, these are the truest and most honest parts of ourselves, end quote. In other words, it's only by looking inwards into your heart, that we can really know who we really are. That's what our culture believes and passionately preaches. Your true self is the one that you choose and you create, no one else. It's self-creation. But do you see how absolutely exhausting and crushing that will end up being? Constantly performing, Constantly slaving away to curate and craft your identity and polish it, finesse it for all to see. Constantly justifying yourself before others. It's all work and no grace. It's enslavement disguised as expressive freedom. Do you see then what good news it is that in Christ... You are not your own workmanship. That you are God's workmanship by grace in Christ. That you are His creation. And that this is the identity that really matters, that we live out of. An identity that you don't have to constantly perform for and maintain. An identity that you receive by grace and not your own doing. Brothers and sisters, we are not self-made people. And that is freeing news. That is good news. God has recreated us, and He is leading us down a path of good works that He has prepared graciously for us before the world even began. Going back to Genesis, in the first day, in the first creation, After each day, God saw that it was good. At the end of day six, 
he saw that it was very good. Well, on the last day then, at the day of Christ, shall he not look at us, his new creation in Christ, abounding in good works, reflecting his likeness, and say, it is exceedingly good. May he say that of each and every one of us on that day as we walk that path of good works as God's good workmanship in Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our merciful and gracious God, we thank you for your relentless resolve to save us and to be our God. We thank you that before we could love you, you loved us before the foundation of the world, and that this love is shown in the way you work in our lives, even now, to lead us down the path of good works to reflect you. Since you have saved us and recreated us in Christ, make us eager to do good and thereby serve you with thankfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.